Welcome to the Naturally Healthy Pets podcast. Let's get to it. Well, welcome to the Naturally Healthy Pets podcast. I'm so glad that you decided to join us this week. Today, my guest is going to be talking to us about five things you don't know about canine and feline kidney disease, which is a great topic because kidney disease is a huge issue for our pets. So my guest today is Alex Roberts. As an animal lover her entire life, her mission is to help every pet live their happiest, longest lives. That sounds familiar. Uh, She's been (laughs) using holistic remedies on wildlife and pets since she was a young child and now has 18 years of professional experience in the pet industry. After receiving her clinical pet nutritionist certification, she started Healing Bay Pet Nutrition LLC to dive deeper into helping more pets benefit from the world of holistic modalities, especially those suffering from chronic disease. Alex, I'm so glad that you agreed to join me today because for those who know me, know that nutrition is my passion and helping pet owners navigate some scary waters definitely is at the top of that list. So welcome. Thank you, Dr. Judy. I am over the moon excited to be here right now. <laughs> so well, that's thank you awesome. so much. <laughs> All right. And I am going to give away a secret that you told me uh, before we started taping. You is can that give away you, my secret. <laughs> you are actually in veterinary school at Michigan State University. So yay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a really scary secret. I I don't it's, like telling, but it's out now. So. It's out of the it's out of the box now. Like everybody knows. But um, you know, it it is so important that we have veterinarians who you know have those initials behind their name because that does give us credibility, but who also have an understanding of nutrition and really what our pets, horses, our animals need um, instead of falling for basically false advertising from the pet food industry and even the veterinary industry. I mean, Mm -hmm. the veterinary industry is so brainwashed. So, so, um, so let's talk about um, feline and canine kidney disease. And we're going to talk about it, you know, kind of uh, how things happen, why they happen, and then some of the things that we can do about that. Um, So I, We have a statement in here, which I had a holistic veterinarian just lay me low on this. Um, And the first statement is that kidney failure is an irreversible process. Now, we say that because when a kidney cell dies, it does not regenerate. Mm -hmm. Liver will regenerate. Other things, you know, skin regenerates. You get a a big degloving wound, skin will regenerate. But kidneys don't. Yeah. Kidneys don't. We kill off kidney cells and they're like, see ya, I'm out of here. But what we can do is we can reverse the illness that occurs around those dead kidney cells. So the toxins that we get in the bloodstream, the dehydration, the feeling horrible, Mm -hmm. we can reverse lab values. We can reverse how the animals feel by using nutrition and our supplements and and treatments. Um, But we cannot regenerate those kidney cells. So that's where, that's why we make this statement of, hey, you know what, when they're gone, they're gone. The good news is dogs and cats can live with about 10% kidney function and can do okay. Mm -hmm. So, but we don't wanna say, oh my gosh, we didn't catch this until they were down to that 10% and now we're trying to reverse everything. Yeah. So uh, studies show that one in 10 dogs suffer from kidney disease. And I would bet, like if we start bro- broke that down by age, particularly in our older cats, oh, we'd yeah. see Massive. very high numbers. Massive. Yeah, so. I mean, I, yeah, I, I my like just total anecdotal observation <laughs> is that I I swear it's probably like 80% of cats end up that yeah. that ends up being their cause of death basically is chronic kidney disease and it's and a lot of it has to do horrible. with nutrition so we're going to we're going to get into that um so uh, early diagnosis is huge that's that yeah. and and we do have better testing than we used to have so yeah. that is good um and i'm going to put a little plug in i have a lab values course where people can learn what the lab values need uh, mean and you know how to interpret that because a lot of times your veterinarian gives you 
little snippets and yeah, bits and that's pieces. that's so good. Mm-hmm. But one of the problems that I see very commonly is the veterinarian will get one high number or the owner will see one high number. Like, oh, look, the BUN's high. Right. And it's like, and they diagnosis. take that one number. Right. And yeah. they take that one number and we have a diagnosis mm-hmm. of, oh my gosh, they're in kidney failure. Well, a high BUN can be caused by a lot of different things. We right. have to combine that. We have to have a urinalysis. We have to see, are the kidneys working to concentrate the urine? Are we losing a bunch of protein in the urine? What's our creatinine looking like? There's so many things yeah. that go into it. So this is, this is a plug for pet parents. Do not ever make a diagnosis based on one number. We have to look at the whole mm-hmm. picture. So we're going to do that. All right. So chronic kidney disease, we used to call it kidney failure. And I think a lot of veterinarians still do. Yeah. Um, I know that Michelle Allen from Monkey's House Senior Dog Hospice and Sanctuary, she's like, why do we call things failure? Yeah. Failure. (laughs) Failure. Let's not focus on the failure. (laughs) I know. It sets us up for failure because it sets us up for the mindset of failure. Mm -hmm. So I do like chronic kidney disease. Right. Better right. I, I think it's cancer. an improvement. It seems to be just the, I, I mean, as you know, you know, there are a million different names for this thing and it's, there's no like universal, <laughs> there's no universally accepted correct. But yeah, it seems like we, generally speaking, you know, it used to be correctly called renal failure and now it's a little bit more correct to call it chronic kidney disease. And yeah, exactly. Like I agree. It's like, well, I guess that's an improvement. I'll take it. But it does mean the same thing and your vet could call it a hundred other things too. And it all means the yeah. same thing. Really the only yeah. differentiation is if you have some kind of chronic kidney problem where it is this uh, slow insidious disease process, or you can have an acute kidney problem where, you know, you've got some nasty chemical your pet has ingested and you're in the emergency room. But beyond having the acute and the chronic process. Yeah. So acute problems we can see from things like antifreeze Mm -hmm. ingestion. So definitely if you've got a car that's leaking from the radiator and you're it's it tastes good to the animals, sadly. So, you know, it doesn't take much, particularly for our kitty cats, to you know, ingest things. Uh, we see uh, kidney failure from grapes. We see um, kidney failure from xylitol. We also see yeah. liver failure with that. We see kidney failure from um, a lot of different medications, uh, over-the-counter medications. Please don't use over-the-counter medications unless your veterinarian has specifically said, I want you to mm-hmm. give a specific dose of something. Mm-hmm. Do I, I worked in emergency medicine for 10 years. Mm-hmm. And let me tell you the, the, the things that people gave their animals. Oh. Um, and don't ever give I your bet. 10 pound cat the same thing you would give an adult person. Like, oh. How does that even oh, make goodness. sense? But, but <laughs> yeah, don't so do that's that. where we get it. You know, acute kidney failure is yeah. when they ingested something or they have an overwhelming infection that it's attacking the kidneys or a cancer that's a, I had a kitty yeah. cat with lymphoma mm-hmm. that attacked his kidneys. So, um, you know, that's when we get into the acute kidney failure. That is an emergency situation. Get them in. Let's try to get them flushed. Let's get things going in the right direction. Yeah. Um, so when you're getting requests from, cause I'm assuming you, you do consultations for people for nutrition. Yeah. Or that's what I have done up until now. Okay. But- <laughs> that's what you've been doing until vet yes. school kind of like took over your life. Precisely. Yeah. Um, so your company is called Healing Bay Pet Nutrition. Yeah. So, uh, so in the past with, with this company, before things got a little overwhelming, <laughs> uh, people would go to your website and say, Ooh, I, I need a nutritional consultation to talk about a specific disease problem or, uh, just basic nutrition. How, yeah. how has that worked? Yeah. So, so th- the reason that this is the topic we're talking about today is because unfortunately, like over half, almost two thirds of the clients I was seeing were bringing pets with chronic kidney disease to me. It just became like hands down the number one thing I saw. And it was like, oh man. And what's crazy is, you know, my whole life, it was just sort of always accepted that like senior cats get chronic kidney disease. But doing this with my own business, it's like, I think I see even more dogs now than I see cats. So it's like, man, like what, like what's, what is happening? And like, we got to do better. What can we do about this? So 
you know, like if so, there's anything I can so, do to just help prevent, you know. Why do you why do you think you're seeing an increase in the number of dogs with kid, chronic kidney disease? <sighs> so, you know, I think it's a lot of things, and I. I don't know if you agree with me or not, but I do think we'll find that <laughs> pretty much everything out there, like, is there a genetic component to it? Probably. And I think in some things you can have really huge genetic components and in some things it's a tiny component. But I think that it's fair to say that in just about everything, genetics are a factor, maybe small. Um, but once your animal exists, we cannot change their genetic makeup. We can change how certain genes are expressed um, and through food primarily um, and through avoiding toxic things in their environment that then cause ex gene expression that we don't want happening. So but beyond that, we can't go retroactively change their genetic makeup. So kind of is what it is. And we just have to focus on the things we can change. And it's never going to be perfect. Um, but the major one is feeding heavily processed foods, um, lots of environmental toxins as well. But, and I don't want to spend half an hour bashing kibble here because I'm sure everyone you have on your we podcast. We spent a lot of time bashing kibble. Exactly. But, you know, first of all, beside the fact that it's over-processed, we're talking extruded kibble here, um, baked kibbles right are big a little kibble, better yeah um but we still have the problem of it's dry it mm -hmm. has four to six percent moisture yep. and the body needs a lot of moisture yep. to su survive yeah. because what's the the number one component in our bodies besides carbon is water water mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> got a lot of it uh yeah a lot of it so for our pets it, it's the same way mm -hmm. so when we're feeding them these overprocessed kibbles um they have a lot of synthetic additives in them mm -hmm. uh may have rancid fats mm -hmm. in them that's just all these toxins and what does the kidney do oh yeah it's eliminates toxins liver, yeah. yeah so the liver filters them and then the kidneys yeah. filter all that stuff and then the kidneys are supposed to spit all that stuff out and you know it's sort of like having uh any machine that you don't put oil in the engine or you don't clean the engine or um so in my case i have a lawnmower a riding lawnmower i'm really mean to my <laughs> riding lawnmower i use it in grass and fields it is way too high i hit big rocks with it all the time and destroy the blades uh i don't think it's had the oil changed or even looked at in the three years that we've owned it <sighs> it it goes through a lot of dust and dirt it lives in a dusty barn and I go through high grass that just totally clogs it up. For a while, it wouldn't go in reverse. And what I discovered is it couldn't go in reverse because it had so much gunk caked up underneath. So if That'll we do, do the same thing, yeah. So if we do the same thing to our pet's bodies and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm only feeding you dry, dusty stuff and I'm putting all these toxins in and those toxins, so environmental toxins can include, you know, things that we spray on our yep. lawn, cleaning chemicals that we're using in the house. Leontic, all, heartworm, all those pesticides everything. that we, yes. all those pesticides that we put on yes. them and in them yep. every month. Um, vaccines, we're, vaccines, you know, we're yes. too many vaccines yep. with a lot of synthetic preservatives and things. Yeah. So, you know, it's sort of like me with my lawnmower. If I were to keep throwing all this at my pet, I would get the same problem. The blades don't cut anymore. Yep. The, the, you know, it's not eliminating the toxins from under the deck anymore. It's all caked up under there. Um, so, you know, I, I've, I've never used my lawnmower as, as an example of kidney disease before, but I'm I like love it. I dig the analogy. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit of a crazy analogy, but, but think about any machine that you use that you don't maintain. Yeah. And that includes your, your own body. But if we don't maintain what, what we're providing as something positive, beneficial, and we're going to talk about some of those things mm -hmm. uh, when we come back, because we need to take a break, but we need to take care of the machines that run our pets' bodies. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. We're going to talk about holistic approaches to preventing and treating chronic kidney disease. 
When your pet gets lab work at the veterinarian, do you understand the results? Renowned holistic veterinarian, Dr. Judy Morgan, explains how to get the most out of the results in her course, Understanding and Interpreting Lab Values. This course will help you crack the code and figure out the puzzling language of common diagnostics such as a CBC, chemistry screen, urinalysis, and endocrine testing. This course is perfect for the veterinary professional looking to learn from a true expert to better serve their patients, or the dedicated pet parent wanting to have more tools in their toolbox to better advocate for their pet. Podcast listeners get to take advantage of a 20% discount using the promo code PODCAST10 at checkout on drgdu.com. Welcome back. I'm here with my guest today, Alex Roberts, who is a clinical pet nutritionist, and uh, we also found out she's in veterinary school, so very, very cool, which means she's incredibly busy person. She's a mom. She's in school. She's still trying to run her business. Yeah, it, it's a crazy life. Just a little. <laughs> fine that's the little it probably won't ever get any less crazy so you know what it doesn't and it's like i'm retired yeah how's that going for you it's you know it's funny when my mother retired from teaching oh gosh 20 years ago or whatever um i had small children at the time so she would help with babysitting and uh then my dad got ill and she took care of him and was running their business and uh, she said how did i ever have time to work and i say this like how did i ever have time to work Uh, it's just we find it you just find a different passion so it just sort of keeps moving all right. Valid. So what are some holistic approaches to treating uh, chronic kidney disease and how do you help clients when they call you and say, I, 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 I'm, in a, I'm in a dilemma? Yeah. I mean, number one, as with pretty much everything, is food. Um, so <laughs> we talked a little bit about kibble and, you know, it's so dry and processed. And I mean, the list goes on. We could talk for hours about that. But um I do think it's really important to meet people where they are. That is just part of my philosophy. Sure. And like, I think it's really important to feed yourself. Um, you know, like, yes, you have a pet, you are obligated to take care of it because it can't take care of itself, but you got to take care of yourself too. So if you're someone that's like, you know, look, I really want to do the absolute best because maybe I do know better, you know, maybe I've, I've worked really hard, I've educated myself, but I can only afford so much here. There are options. There are really good kind of like intermediate options. Um, But what I say, your absolute best option, and again, this really applies to just about anything, is homemade fresh food. So raw to lightly cooked, depending on the individual um, and lots of factors. But that's time consuming. Um, It can actually be extremely cost effective. Like, to be honest, I say that homemade is the most economic way to feed your pet because if you're wise about shopping you can get stuff really cheap but then on top of that like i can pretty much guarantee you're gonna save a lot in vet bills down the road (laughs) so it really can save you tons of tons of money um up front and down the road but it is time consuming I, i totally understand it's just not for everyone um especially for dogs honestly in some ways cats can be simpler because a lot of them thrive with like almost no vegetable matter whereas most dogs do better with some kind of produce in their diet so it's kind of an extra step you have to take but um there are lots of compromises so there are commercial foods you can buy which will be a little bit more pricey um there is one generic go-to of mine as far as a commercial food but that i think of as as close to ideal as you're going to get. I really like using Steve's real food. Um, love Steve's. Yeah. So it's, it's a frozen raw food. Um, but as far as a, you know, if we're in kind of moderate per their blood work, uh, kidney, kidney disease, it's just a really good compromise. It's really high quality protein. I, I trust the company. They use good ingredients. Um, and it's just really nicely balanced. It's not going to be extremely high protein, but it's going to be it's going to be a nice moderate protein level, but really high quality protein, nice moderate fat. Um, there are still other options. Um, a, a good go to that I find a lot of people find as a good compromise is using like a dehydrated food. Um, like you had said something about the baked kibbles earlier. Like I know a ton of companies make the baked kibbles now, but. Um, 
a dehydrated is normally a lot cheaper than a baked kibble, but it's yeah. similar process to a baked kibble. And it's kind of different companies make slightly different, you know, uh, formulas, but yeah. it's some kind of powdery, chunky thing that you add water to. So therefore yeah. you're getting your, the you're getting your moisture in and you're getting more nutrition versus a heavily processed food because it's only cooked at a couple hundred degrees versus 600 plus degrees. And that really right. is a big difference as far as actually yes. retaining those nutrients that are in there. Cause otherwise, you know, I say you can pick up a bag of kibble and it's like, Oh, that's so nice. Look at all these lovely, you know, meat products and blueberries and all these other lovely things in here, but they are cooked to literal death. And all the nutrients that we know make those things good for us, a lot of them just and aren't there anymore. They're, they're in very small quantities. Right. So you'll see right. all these yes. lovely fruits and vegetables on the, the on the label, you know, in beautiful bright yeah. colors. But then when you actually read the label, it's like, oh, there's probably one blueberry yeah. in there. So if you're lucky, uh, so if the label's even telling the truth. I, I do like the what we call the base mixes, the dehydrated um yeah, so you can, you can buy you can control a complete, the protein. Right. Yeah. You can buy a complete diet uh, that you add, just add water, or you can buy a base mix and add your own protein, add your own oils. So you have a lot of control over that, particularly for pets with um, sensitivities and that yeah, sort of thing. Absolutely. We actually carry the Steve's freeze dried. Yep. So basically same, same product, just add water. And we actually have quite a few companies that are very similar that are very high end that don't have synthetic additives in them. So for anybody who wants the list of foods that I'm willing to feed my own pets, if you sign up for our newsletter on drjudymorgan.com, you'll get an email that says, this is what's in Dr. Judy's freezer and in Dr. Judy's cabinet for her own animals. Um, so moisture is is really critical, but you you also mentioned protein. Yeah. And so this has been a myth in the veterinary industry literally since I was in vet school in the oh, early yeah. 1980s. And I'm sure so long we're before going back 40 too. years. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I I remember as a new graduate those first few years in practice before I learned anything about nutrition and holistic pet health. I used to say the same thing. Oh my gosh, you have a senior pet. We've got to reduce their protein. Yeah. We've got uh, some early or late kidney disease. They can't have all this protein. And it is such a myth. Would you like to talk about <laughs> protein and kidney yes. disease? I, I'm going to get your take. I think it's the same as yes. mine. But Yeah, yeah, I, I would love to. And, you know, I, as you pointed out, it's this myth in the veterinary industry it's still a myth in human medicine too. And and like we're oh omnivores, Lord. we're not carnivores like dogs and cats. Sure. But to me, when even the the studies in humans show that humans actually in chronic kidney disease do better with high quality and relatively high quantity of protein in their diet, humans put quality. on right humans put on restricted protein quantity that are in um, late stage chronic kidney disease or failure have increased risk of death compared to those given lots of protein. And again, we're omnivores. So like just logical conclusion, we can at least say for our carnivores, it's probably that much more important. And yeah. there, there, there really, there is no good data showing that there is any um, reason to restrict protein levels. Um, phosphorus, I think in some cases, pets tend to do better with a little bit less phosphorus, which does come from protein. Um, so what I like to do, and this is where uh, just one of the many reasons homemade is best, because you can really make these changes. Whereas when you're feeding a commercial food, the phosphorus in a lot of ways kind of is what it is. There's not much you can do about it. But with a homemade diet, normally for a healthy animal, I'm all about adding raw bones or at least a bone meal to the diet. And we use that as a calcium and phosphorus source, but that can very easily be swapped out for just eggshell. Eggshells are great and they're an amazing source of calcium, but they don't have all the phosphorus. Um, yep. So that's, that's, that's my go-to solution to that problem. Um, yeah. Uh, and, and, it is a myth that needs to be busted because 
what I saw in practice for so many years, because the first 10 years of practice, I was very traditional. We sold a lot of prescription diets, which now I'm just like, oh my Lord, I'm so but sorry. But you learned so animals, much from that experience, that. you know? <laughs> Thank God. Um, but what we would see, we would put these animals on these really restricted, and talk about an oxymoron. Here, you have an animal in kidney failure. Here's a dry yes. kibble <laughs> with so 4% moisture and very low protein. I mean, some of these diets are seven, eight, nine percent protein. Mm -hmm. We know that our dogs, an adult dog needs 18 percent and an adult cat needs 28. And that's bare the bare minimum. That's minimum. literally to survive. That is AFCO's yeah. bare minimum yeah. to survive. That's why they didn't yeah. die in 12 we, weeks on this amount of protein. Yeah, exactly. So, but we're telling these clients with these senior pets who are already muscle wasted. Mm -hmm. They're already having mobility issues because they don't have any muscle or fat to yes. support their bony yes. frame. And then we're restricting protein. And so what does the body do? It breaks down even more mm -hmm. muscle to get the protein that it needs to make the heart pump and the kidneys function and the brain mm -hmm. function. Uh, it takes the fats out of the body. Most of these animals are just don't have enough fat mm -hmm. on their on their bones anyway. So we have problems with fat soluble vitamin absorption. We have vitamin D deficiencies. We have so many problems by restricting protein. And I really do feel like we shorten their lifespan. I know we do. We yeah. shorten their lifespan by putting them on a dry kibble with low protein. It is just absolutely the opposite of what we should be supplying. We need to be having high moisture. We need to have good high quality protein. And uh, interestingly, IRIS, the International Renal Society, uh, I always that forget makes what's the all stages their eyes. Is too. <laughs> I, I, yeah. But they actually have come out and said, yeah, protein restriction is not that great an yeah. idea, but we do need to watch the phosphorus. And this is where the lab work comes in. Mm -hmm. And we say, oh, look, his phosphorus is under five. That's great. We don't have to do yep. anything. Oh, who his phosphorus is now up to seven or eight. Okay. We Let's can, restrict yeah, we some can do phosphorus something about in the diet. That. Yep. And that makes a bigger difference. I mean, if we, if we're really getting into deep doo doo, we can do phosphate binders, but a lot of times we can just manipulate the diet to, to make that be where we need it to be. So we only have a couple minutes left. What supplements, um, do you, you know, just as a general category, yeah. what mm -hmm. supplements do you feel are helpful for these animals with chronic kidney? Yeah. Disease? Yeah. And this is very generic indeed, because, you know, as you know, like everyone really does need a tailored individualized approach, but there are a handful of things that pretty much they're not going to hurt anyone and they're going to help everyone at least a little bit. Um, so one is putting them on a high quality probiotic with prebiotic so that hopefully that probiotic is actually accomplishing something. Um, and then along with the digestive enzyme, um, it's helps pretty much everything, but it's just, it's one step we can take to help take some of the load off of those kidneys. Um, another one that I have I've become a fan of over the years, I wasn't always sold on this, but I do really like using like a desiccated kidney or like a kidney extract. Um, the whole like nourishes like concept. I was like, I don't know, it sounds good, but does it really do anything? But over the years, I've just, my observation is that I've really seen it make a difference. So it's something I recommend yep. to everyone now. Um, and also in my own body, I can vouch for it too with things that I've done for myself. Um, and then another one is a high quality fish oil. So to get those good omega-3s in there. Um, and yes, there are tons of sources of omega-3s, but I do specifically recommend um, krill oil um, or even like canned sardines in packed in water with no salt added. Um, you don't want them like packed in olive oil, but those are really awesome source of omega-3s um, versus using like a salmon oil because salmon are big predatory fish. So then they get, it's called biomagnification, but it's the process of the higher the predator is in the food chain, the more toxins are built up in its body. So trying to avoid adding toxins to our poor struggling kidneys here. So <laughs> we like small critters low on the food chain. So the krill oil, um, the sardines, those are, those are awesome. Um, those are my my like good for everyone like would always recommend those there are a couple herbs that are really gentle 
and yet effective. Um, and I don't know of any cases in which they would be contraindicated. Uh, so dandelion, <clears throat> um, especially dandelion leaf versus dandelion root. Dandelion root's helpful too, though. But so a lot of companies make like a blend. That's totally fine. Um, super helpful. Helps with circulation, helping to the liver and the kidneys to essentially work together, get those toxins out of the body. Um, and then hawthorn, hawthorn berry. It's another one, gentle, safe for everyone. Um, and that is circulation. And um, a lot of patients when they're in end stage, you, you see you end up with congestive heart failure and the kidney failure simultaneously, along with a lot of other problems. But those two, like, almost always go hand in hand, it seems, when you're in the end stages of these disease. So the hawthorn is particularly good for the heart as well as the kidneys. Um, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, those are all things that we recommend as well. Those uh, prebiotic, probiotic are going to help in the large intestine to help with the detoxification, help lower those nitrogen waste products, mm -hmm. supply short chain fatty acids. Mm -hmm. So many things that they're doing there. So it is something that we absolutely don't want to overlook. Alex, I cannot believe it, but we are out <laughs> of time. I can't it either. Um, so uh, where can people get more information about Healing Bay Pet Nutrition? Yeah, well, my website is uh, just healingbaypet.com. Um, you can email me. It's alex at healingbaypet.com. Um, I'm unfortunately, I'm really not taking new clients right now. <laughs> so I'm really just here to hopefully, you know, hopefully we helped someone by being here. But uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, you know, when you, when you get your book written or get a course <laughs> written, you let us know and we'll be happy to promote those. But in the meantime, thank you so very much for the tips that you've given our listeners today. And um, hopefully we have supplied some help for people because this is a big mm -hmm. problem with our pets, unfortunately. Thank you very much, Alex. It's been a great thank pleasure. Thank you so much, Dr. Morgan. It's been awesome. Thanks for listening to another great Naturally Healthy Pets episode. Be sure to check out the show notes for some helpful links. And if you enjoy the show, please be sure to follow and listen for free on your favorite podcast app. We value your feedback and would love to hear from you on how we're doing. Visit drjudymorgan.com for healthy product recommendations, comprehensive courses, upcoming events, and other fantastic resources. Until next time, keep giving your pet the vibrant life they deserve. The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform. It is no substitute for professional care by a veterinarian, licensed nutritionist, or other qualified professional. You're encouraged to do your own research and should not rely on this information as professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Dr. Judy and her guests express their own views, experience, and conclusions. Dr. Judy Morgan's Naturally Healthy Pets neither endorses or opposes any particular view discussed here.